So welcome to Classics You Slept Through. We are a book podcast where we read and discuss classic books. I'm your host, Kyle Davis, along with a girl who definitely knows how to quit when she's ahead, my mm. sister, Meredith. How's it going, Mayor? Hey, I do know when to quit when I'm ahead. <laughs> I just quit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. As we will find out how we, uh, we quit this thing. Uh, this book that we've we've been reading for a very long time that we're very glad that we'll be finally quitting this is the uh, longest one and not because it's the longest one <laughs> no yeah it's just taking us the longest uh, so hey mary have you uh, have you heard of this thing called spotify oh kyle i have i've heard of spotify good did you know you can listen to podcasts on spotify i did there's this excellent did one you... called no <laughs> Yes. Did you further know that you now can rate podcasts on Spotify? So if you too are listening to us on Spotify, please go down onto the show page and give us a little star rating. You can rate us one through five. We would be much appreciative of that. If you're not listening to us on Spotify, I mean, you can still go to Spotify and rate us if you'd like, uh, but why don't you jump onto Apple podcasts and leave us a rating and review. Let us know how we're doing things. We could do different things. We could do better. Uh, because it helps other people find the show. It helps us do things different and better. Hopefully, the that's the goal, right? <laughs> All right, so today we're talking about the last bit of uh, Three Men in a Boat, To Say Nothing of the Dog by Jerome K. Jerome, a humorous travelogue of these three guys going down the Thames River in the late 1800s. And why don't we get into this? Hmm? Let's do it. All right, so this section, we start out with chapter 16, and chapter 16 is, I would call it a payoff chapter, if you've been reading the entire book. Mm. So all throughout the beginning of the book, or the earlier chapters, uh, our author, narrator Jerome, is regaling us with how wonderful boating is on the Thames, and he's <laughs> multiple times discussed how terrible steam launches are, and how they muck up the river and they, they wreck it for regular boaters uh, until we get to chapter 16 and they get towed by a steam launch and suddenly he can't say enough great things about a steam launch. He doesn't have to row. He doesn't have to steer. He just lets the steam launch pull them along. And all of a sudden, all these smaller boats that are all around the Thames, they just get yes. in the way. They're just, they're just awful. And you never know how how much these tiny skiffs and boats can get in the way than than when you're being towed by a, a steam launch which which apparently is captained or is is controlled by his friends so i'm wondering if his dislike of steam launches has something to do with some sort of like grudge he holds against these friends because he knows <laughs> them and he he never mentioned in his hatred of steam launches oh yeah yeah, yeah my buddies i have one so right that sounds like Jay, as he calls himself, sounds like something he'd do. Yes, definitely. And the fact that uh, earlier he had mentioned that he enjoys buzzing steam launches and mm -hmm. lazing about and getting in their way as well. Now he you know, is railing against the folks that are doing that. <laughs> we kind of get a nice callback to work as well. You know, we, we've learned that Jay is kind of, um, you know, allergic to work. He doesn't like to do hard work and I think rowing the Thames is nothing but hard work. He so, loves work. He collects so much of that's it. That's right. He collects it, right? He doesn't want to doesn't want to wreck it. Do it. He doesn't do it. Uh, but I thought this was fun that, you know, it was his turn to row like two miles. And he's like, and now look, we were like six miles up the river. And I figured that was my that was my uh that was my turn. The steam launch hauled them and and George and uh, Harris were not having it and they still made him pull his turn when it was time to go. Uh, so then we get to just a sort of bizarre aside. Seriously. Like it came out of nowhere in this humorous book. Yeah. Is this woman is dead in the river, face down and floating. Yeah. And we get um, her story, basically. Uh, they, I guess they learn it later. The like, guys, they see this body. They see it, and like George leans over, and they're like, "What is that?" And he grabs hold of it, flips it over, and then of right. course, is, gives a cry, and his face is blanched. And right? How cool 
close do you have to get to a floating dead body to know that it's a floating dead body? I mean, we had the floating dead dog earlier. You know, I took them away. I mean, when they were making, <laughs> they're not the quickest. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> Most absurd. Um, but yeah, so apparently this woman. Oh, it's so sad. Tragic story. It was a a poor woman, survived on twelve shillings a day, I think, and a uh, single mom with a kid. Apparently has an affair is what he alludes to, I believe, and then turns out she gets uh, thrown out from her family and i i think the implication is she throws herself in the river is, yeah. that, is that how you took it absolutely she yeah. she um couldn't take it she tried as long as she could everybody turned her away she buys her kid a little box of chocolates and gives it to her and and, and he says you know makes no other sign that anything else is going on gives her kid a little box of chocolates and then goes on her way like has enough money for a passage or a train ticket or whatever to go to this specific spot or near there because I don't know how long she's floated and throws herself in the river and, and and he alludes that this was perhaps also where she found her happiness under the like deep cover of the bowing or the the tree limbs that touch the ground. And so perhaps this is where she had been. I, I feel like he was alluding to this is where she also had sinned, as he called it. Yes. And so yeah. these were where her happy days were, but also her darkest. And she throws it, throws herself into the river with her last few shillings after she gave her kid some chocolate and just... Right. <sighs> like definitely a a totally different section than the rest of this book so i was a little yeah. i was a little taken aback when we we hit that portion the, the last line he said thus she sinned in all things sinned in living and in dying god help her and all other sinners if any more there be so I, in looking this up apparently at the of the time it was popular or the right thing to do or it was in fashion to throw some sort of commentary into your book about uh, okay society about poverty to make some sort of allusion to a moral calling like look what happens when we don't take care of our poor or when we treat people like sinners gotcha. where so i think okay. he's tongue-in-cheek like and if there are any more sinners like let god help because like you guys aren't and then he mentions like um, how she sinned out of wedlock. And he's like, as we do from time to time. <laughs> right. <mentions>. <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't really yeah. seem to be throwing real judgment on her. But it's done in the, the, you know, the way he does of a more dry, sarcastic humor. But it was dark for right. this. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. All right, then we get into chapter 17. Uh, yeah. I feel like George, uh, I'm out of whiskey. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, a little, bit, a little bit lighter here in 17. Uh, we start off with the guys trying to uh, wash their clothes in the Thames, which was, okay, they, dirty water. They said, you know, the clothes came out dirtier than when they had gone in. And then the rest of this chapter is consumed with fish and fishing. So, you know, a lot of this was kind of you know to use a cliche sort of par for the course on fishing right we just talk about right. how fishermen like to exaggerate okay he talks a lot about well you know if i catch one fish i'll say 10 and but the other fishermen well they think it should have been 20 and how many fish are we pulling out and it just kind of went on and on with you know belaboring the point on yes fishermen like to multiply <laughs> how many fish they caught well, I, I get it i like the setup of it though the setup of of you know, you can't just come in and be like, I caught 50 fish today. Can you believe that? Like, no fisherman would stoop so low as to tell a lie like that. And then he says, because lying is immoral. So you wouldn't do that. Right. But he does the thing like, <laughs> shout out to mom because she does this. Love you, mom. Where it's like, <laughs> you pull them in by saying something. Well, I had a haul on Tuesday, but it's not worth telling about. You know, right. that, that thing that you say as if you don't want anyone to talk about it, but you do <laughs> want ask, someone to want talk to ask about, about it. it. Yeah. Like the way you laugh out loud in a fake way when you're reading the newspaper and you want people to be like, what's so funny? And it's... 
Do, do you still read newspapers? No. You okay, do. You're definitely dating yourself. I, I don't get a newspaper. I thought you got the New York Times. Oh. I mean, I read online. I don't get a newspaper. Oh. <laughs> Gets, who gets newspapers anymore? They sound so nice when you turn the pages. They do. They, yeah, do. they do. Anyway, that's how you actually start a fisherman story. I don't expect anyone would believe me if I told this story. There's like a, not just a pride in the fishing and in the exaggeration, but in the way you tell the exaggeration and you pull people in. And I don't, I don't think he's alluding to like people would actually believe you. But they respect the way you tell the the unbelievable story. Sure, yeah. And all this discussion of the fishing and the fish stories comes after he talks about how terrible the uh, the fishing is on the Thames and how difficult right. it is. And you know how fishermen will say, Oh, I know a great spot where there's a lot of fish. And he's like, Well, yeah, there's a lot of fish there. You can't catch any of them. Yeah. But they, you can see them. But nobody ever catches any of these <laughs> They'll fish. bother you if you go swimming, but they will not right. get on your hook. And which is also great if we sum up everything else that we've read that, you know, we're fishing in the Thames, but, you know, we have dead women and dead animals and washing our clothes makes the clothes even dirtier. So would you really want, I don't know if you'd really want to eat the fish that you're pulling out of. It's like the people, Thames here. people fish in the school kill and all the time in Philly. I see people, they line up along, you know, they're lined up. Yeah. My, my brother-in-law fishes. Yeah. He would go down and pull catfish out with his bare hands. Huge catfish. Huge. Nobody's eaten oh, them. Right. I wouldn't eat no. anything that came out of the school kill. <laughs> Never. <laughs> but people fish well, speaking all of the fish time. that you don't eat, uh, our final kind of vignette in this chapter is the guys go to a pub just for some, some dinner that night, and there's a gigantic fish on the wall. And we go through... Uh, a multiple number of other patrons come into the bar and talk about this fish. And, oh, you guys are looking at that fish. Well, let me tell you how I caught it. And then they leave and the next guy comes in and, oh, no, that guy said that. Well, I'll tell you how I caught the fish. And So everyone going through the bar ends up catching the fish until at the very end. Um, what, what happened? Did, did George bump it or something? Or, yeah. Or well, we have it, to get a closer look. It went all the way up to the owner of the bar being like, oh, those guys said they caught it. Well, that would be funny. Right. If they caught it, gave it to me, and then I put it on my wall. No, I caught it. Right. And then George bumps it, smashes it to the ground, and it ends up that it's plaster of Paris, which is like right. the end, the, like the last, <laughs> the last line of the chapter is like, it was plaster of Paris. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Off. <laughs> all right so that gets us into chapter 18 where we talk about uh they're going through the lock and so of course you know it triggers a story and jerome starts talking about a time before when he and george were going through a lock and turns out there was a photographer going to take some photos of another boat and they kept sort of getting in the way and eventually posing, they get the, they were head. posing yeah they probably right, looked they were, real good right because they knew they were going to be in this picture and then eventually the the bow of their boat gets stuck i think in like the lock mechanism that's the wheel that's turning and they have to push themselves back and they end up falling on on the ground and uh that's when the photographer got the picture and mm -hmm. it turns out their feet are like the, the most prominent thing in the photograph and the the folks who had contracted the photographer not very happy and they want jerome and george to pay for it and of course they don't um, anyway so i think the best part of that is when everyone's trying to warn them they're like check your nose meaning the nose of their boat and right. he's like well i looked at george's nose and it was fine i guess and i tried to look at my own nose what i could see of it it was fine <laughs> and it was just an absurd moment of i could just see it in a movie some sort of slapstick ridiculous comedy that they didn't notice that they were being called out and people kept calling them right. uh, to fix their boat and they didn't they ruined the picture exactly yep uh, then we talk about the effects of river air and how you know he gives you great examples of how people are so kind and they're so gentle when you're on land but there's something about the air of the river that once you get onto the water uh, people are yelling and screaming at each other. And they're even the sweetest of girls will be swearing at them. And, uh, you know, 
And you'd, you'd mentioned earlier that uh, it's sort of like road rage incidents yeah. here on the river. Everybody who isn't driving your car is an idiot. And you, of course, are always doing the right thing in your car. So it's, right. as soon as you get on the road, no matter who it is, you're ang- I always wished I had an I'm sorry horn. <laughs> <laughs> you know there's things you don't mean to do and then people get really angry at you and i try not to beep ben is different and so vince will be in the back seat and he's like mommy beep at them i'm like i don't beep people get mad they come at you with a crossbow you don't exactly. beep at people Stay away. it's like everyone's a terrible driver if they're not you and also you're always the best singer in your car right <laughs> As soon as you get in the car, everybody is like Beyonce or I don't know who was a great male singer, George Michael, Freddie Mercury. Sure. Yeah. Everyone's sure. Freddie Mercury or Beyonce when they get in the car. <laughs> Everyone sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we will get a little more singing because uh, we, can't, we yeah. can't finish this book without one last song, right? Aww. So that gets us into our final chapter of the book, chapter 19. We have reached the end and, uh, you know, also all, all through all these chapters, I've been just sort of uh, eliding over the actual travelogue portions because they're the travelogue portions are legitimate. He's just giving sort of travel advice. He's like, "Okay, this town's pretty good. Go see these tombs. Uh, this one's pretty good. Uh, you get a get a bite at this hotel here. Uh, you know, it's kind of done there, right?" And as we talked about before, it sparked a lot of travel. This book like inspired a lot of people of the time to go do what he did and travel in the right. times increased quite a bit after this book came out. So he does a good job exactly. of it. Yeah. Um, so if you're using the book just as a, you know, travel guide, I guess in the late 1800s serves that purpose as well. Uh, but then we get in 19. So he talks about they're in Oxford and Montmorency has a lot of dogs to fight. So it's kind of great, it. you know, terrific fighting. Uh, and then we get some ruminations on, you know, if you're going to do this kind of practical advice, if you're going to boat the Thames, should you purchase your own boat and bring it? Or should you just get a rental boat on the Thames? Mm-hmm. And so he goes through a story from the past when he decided to, and some friends got together and, and rented a boat. They rented the pride of the Thames. <laughs> and we just go through a, a lot of, you know, it's basically, you know, a relic on the water. You know, it's not, it, it basically can't uh, can't float he's worried about it um you know sort of jokey between him and the the boy and who brings the boat the boat owner you know oh so is this a roman relic what era is this <laughs> from oh, no sir <laughs> yes this is this is the pride of the thames come now um then we get back to our journey itself uh the boys are kind of getting depressed it's mm-hmm. raining yeah, they're kind of tired it's towards the end of their trip now they do a little gambling in the boat. Uh, they have George pull out the banjo and say, George, play us a, a humorous song, please. And so, you know, George starts to play a, a humorous song and it makes them sad. They start crying. They're starting to feel homesick. <laughs> they're sobbing. They're, they're sobbing. <laughs> they, they start to think about, um, you know, think about how great you know, this bar would be tonight or, or this restaurant we could go to or this show we could go see. If only we were back, you know, wouldn't that be wonderful? And then just casually, uh, I think it was what Harris mentions, well, you know, a uh, train does leave Pangborn, just saying. So they, they pull into Pangborn, they drop the boat off with the, the dockman and they tell him, you know, just by the way, you know, we'll be back in the morning, of course, for the boat. But should something, you know, just in case something happens. Unforeseen. Here, yes. Something unforeseen happens. Here's the address to send our stuff to. And then in the very next paragraph, they're, they're walking into a show in London, <laughs> uh, all muddy and bedraggled. They are the talk of the, of the ballet. Then they go get something to eat. They think about their journey. They offer a toast to three men well out of a boat, Montmorency barks, and we have finished the book. And there's a cheeky little picture of what, Poseidon? Cheersing with his... Yes. Trident and his his... waders on? I don't know why Poseidon would wear waders. (laughs) The boys did well to travel down the river. And and so that is it. 
some of this was really beautifully written. Some of the descriptions of the of just the land and nature in in this particular part, um, which, as much as sometimes I would gloss over the descriptions of of the travel log portion of like, right, you know, come down from this town to this town, and this is what they do there. Some of the description, uh, Jerome K. Jerome really highlights how well he can write. So I, I feel like I don't know much about this author other than this book. This is basically but... all he wrote. This is all he's known for. <clears throat> he wrote a sequel, I think. Uh, but otherwise, I, I think after he gained fame with this, uh, I think he was like a magazine publisher or magazine editor or hmm. something like that. And maybe some of this we should save for the wrap up, but like yeah, the, the, the relatability of like just seeing Road Rage in the in the cars and mm -hmm. and like the idea of you see someone taking a picture and you fix your image and the the idea of like who you want to be or think you are versus who you are like he's like i'm great at work i collect <laughs> like yes, i'm the exactly. hardest e each person thinks the other person is not doing enough work um i don't know so much of this resonated in 2021 and 22 since we've been reading it for quite some time <laughs> i've been reading it for so long <laughs> It's just well, it's just, it's just well. Anyway, it's well written. It might have ended yeah. a, quite abruptly and gotten real dark at the end. It did, but apparently he was writing it while writing it in sections, like in different points of traveling. So I've heard, so I've read, and that might be cause for the different tones and moods that he seems to bring out. But I, sure. I don't know. I enjoyed yeah. it. Yeah, I, I thought it was overall pretty good, too. So this was a very short section. Uh, yes. So this is a, a short episode, actually. We got through this pretty fast. So uh, anything else on these three, these four chapters um, to discuss here? Before we, like, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward section. Yeah, Montmorency seems like a really brave fighter. I mean, 11 he, fights he one really day, 14 much. the next. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of fights. Do the dog dogs. didn't have a whole lot to do, yeah wonder what the state yeah, of stray dogs in London is these days. Probably not very good. It's probably... I don't know. Cats, maybe, but... Yeah. Any London listeners, let us know. How many stray dogs you yeah, got running seriously. around? <laughs> seriously. <laughs> From Mount Morrissey to fight. Yeah. All right. So next time, we'll wrap up this book, and we'll discuss... We'll start talking about our next book. And so that'll be a little preview for next time. Um... So until uh, till then, you can find us on all of our social medias at CYST Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and the like. Uh, also here on Reddit as well. We stream the some chapters now and then, and then go into our discussion episodes. Uh, so, anything else we want to wrap this one up? We mentioned everything at the top. Spotify reviews, no, not reviews, but Spotify ratings now, yeah, yeah. as well as, yeah. You can find us on YouTube as well. Search it for Classics You Slept Through. So until next time, uh, this has been Classics You Slept Through. Uh, put your heads down on the desks because it is time to play 7-Up. Hey. Don't look at my shoes. Cheating. No, not at all. Cheater. Seriously. <laughs>